All right, I would like to welcome you to this um, session uh, in which we're going to have one of our graduate students uh, present his work. But I wanted to start off by talking to you just for a second about the environmental humanities at ASU. The environmental humanities at ASU got established in 2009 with an undergraduate certificate, but we've essentially been very much on the map ever since 2009. And so if you look out in the world at ASU's reputation in the, in the environmental humanities is quite strong. There are tens of thousands of environmental humanists that are networked around the world through various um, institutions and um, including the Humanities for the Environment. Humanities for the Environment is headquartered at ASU. At, we're the North American Observatory and so we're networked into e e all of these um, uh, professional organizations. Um, in 2015, we established the Environmental Humanities Initiative, and uh, the, since, since that took off, we've had a, a series of lectures that have included Jonathan Bate, Mary Evelyn Tucker, Amitav Ghosh, and Michael Hume. So we're bringing in both scientists and humanists uh, to talk <clears throat> about the ways in which we're, we're essentially uh, networking across all of the dis disciplines, the sciences, social sciences, and the humanities. Uh, in 2015, uh, Matt Henry came and talked to me about the possibility of working in the environmental humanities, and I invited him to come to the 2015 Association for the Study of Literature and Environment Conference, which was in Moscow, Idaho. He came to that conference, he saw the possibilities, and essentially since that time he has just taken off in the field. And um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about his accomplishments. Uh, and then uh, tell you the, talk, the title of this talk and why this talk is one of his accomplishments. He is ABD in um, English and Environmental Humanities and he's working with Claudia Sadowski-Smith and I on his dissertation. His dissertation is entitled Hydra Narratives, Reading Water in the Anthropocene and it explores the ways in which the US and post-colonial writers and artists are framing the environmental crisis connected to research source development, especially uh, water in terms of social and economic justice. Now, at ASU, we're sort of a powerhouse in uh, environmental justice. We have several faculty that work in environmental justice and we're quite proud of Matthew because he is pioneering what, what is coming to be called the energy humanities. And this talk to, that he's given today is part of that uh, sort of um, innovation in the, the energy humanities. But this isn't his only work. His, his most recent scholarly and creative work um, has appeared in Isle, which is the premier, di uh, premier journal of the environmental humanities. Um, it, that's the Interdisciplinary Studies of Literature and Environment. And he's also published in Ariel, a review of international English literature, in Oxford University Press blogs, in High Country News, and he won, I think, what, second place in a short story uh, com competition that was called Everything Change, an Anthology of Climate Fiction. He's clear currently serving as a member of the Standing Committee on Activism for the Association for the Study of Literature in, and Environment. So he's already networking in the field and uh, establishing himself as a figure. And he is also the literary editor for the ASU Climate Futures Initiative, uh, which is the climate fiction contest of which he, he won uh, a prize. Today he's gonna talk to us about extractive fictions and this is a test run for a talk that he was invited to give um, at the Stanford University Environmental Humanities Project. So let's welcome Matthew Henry. Okay, thank you, Joni, for that introduction, and uh, thanks everybody for being here. It's a, I know it's a very busy time in the semester, um, so thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. What is this, the second to last day of the semester? Uh, um, coming to join me. Um, so before I begin uh, with my talk here, which is a, a portion of a chapter of my dissertation, I wanted to give you a little bit of an aside um, as to what inspired this specific work. This is something I probably, ha I don't even think I've shared uh, with, with Joni and Claudia, but um, when I decided to, um, start writing about energy and extraction in my dissertation. Um, I, I started researching, but I was repeatedly drawn to the region of northern and central Appalachia. And this was for two reasons. One, energy is very central to the cultural imagination in Appalachia. But another reason is personal. Um, the first 14 years of my life, I grew up in and around the Appalachian Mountains um, in eastern Tennessee, southern Virginia, um, western Pennsylvania, and also New Hampshire. And growing up um, around my 
an extended family. I uh, learned from my great grandfather that he uh, began working in a coal mine when he was 14 years old after he dropped out of uh, middle school. He worked with his father for four years in a coal mine, and his father, um, who had been mining long before that, eventually settled with a local coal company near uh, Wellsboro, Pennsylvania, um, after contracting black lung disease. Um, later on, um, my or my uh, paternal grandfather, grandparents, um, unfortunately signed a, uh, a natural gas or signed a, a lease to um, have natural gas drilled underneath their land in the same area after coal sort of died out in the region. Um, and part of the reason was to help uh, pay for my grandmother's leukemia bills. And so um, this has always been, the, the idea of energy in Appalachia has always been a very personal one uh, for me, um, especially starting to work on this project and thinking about how it's influenced my family's history. And so in writing this, it, I, I sort of uh, approached it um, thinking about my own uh, experiences um, in Appalachia. So, um, with that, I'll begin, um, and um, I, I look forward to your questions uh, afterwards. Okay, in Ann Pancake's 2007 novel, Strange as This Weather Has Been, Bant, a teenager living in the heart of Appalachian coal country in southern West Virginia, surveys a ruined hollow above her family's property after a flash flood. Any more, she notes. It seemed there was too much water, or too little. The temperature too high or too low? Strange as this weather has been, people would say. And she knew. The weather was linked not to the rest of this mess, but she wasn't sure how. Such extreme climatic flux, symptomatic of global warming, can be linked to modernity's continued appetite for fossil fuels. This includes coal extracted from places in West Virginia, home to the highest concentration of active coal mines in the United States. Yet, the mess to which Bant refers is not the local manifestation of climate change, but instead the human and environmental costs of coal extraction, flash floods, coal slurry mudslides, acid mine drainage, forest dead zones, black lung disease, increased cancer rates, and crippling poverty. Extraction in the novel is not merely framed as a crucial link within a chain of causality in which fossil fuel consumption drives global environmental change. Instead, coal development and its socio-ecological impacts are cast as part and parcel of the Anthropocene, the proposed, recently proposed epic in which the human species represents the primary causal agent behind rising global temperatures, declining biodiversity, and drastic changes to major Earth systems. Strange as this weather has been is less concerned with strange weather than with a grotesque climate of environmental and economic precarity in communities that have historically functioned as key nodes in the extractive economy. Pancake's novel, which I'm going to refer throughout this talk to as strange for brevity's sake, exemplifies what I call extractive fictions, a phrase I use to refer to cultural productions that map the socio-ecological impacts of energy extraction on nearby communities. In this talk, I will examine strange, or I, in related work, by rendering, um, that renders visible the ecological and cultural impacts of energy development, and that challenges the deep-seated role of extraction as a cornerstone of regional cultural identity and the mythos of fossil fuel development as a path to social and economic progress. I will close by highlighting instances in which artists are collaborating with scholars, scientists, architects, and engineers to envision what I call post-extractive futures. I highlight two reclamation art projects in Appalachia, the AMD and Art Project in Vintondale, Pennsylvania, and artist activist John Sabra's Toxic Art Initiative, that literally and metaphorically reverse processes of extraction through a combination of innovative water reclamation techniques, visual art, landscape architecture, and memorial. In doing so, they prompt a community-centered epistemological shift away from extraction culture. Extraction, by definition, is an act of removal. In the context of large-scale natural resource development, it refers to Capitalism's fundamental logic of withdrawal without corresponding deposit except as externalities of non-value in the form of pollution, waste, climate change, illness, and death. This is a really nice definition used to frame a recent conference at the University of, uh, University of California, 
um, Santa Cruz, um, a two-day conference on extraction. Um, and I, I think it really communicates um, what, I'm, what I'm looking at here in this project. Um, extractive fictions attend to these externalities and ideologies driving extraction as much as they do to the fetishized resource itself, whether that's coal, natural gas, or oil. And because extraction disproportionately takes place in or near poor ethnic minority and indigenous communities, such communities are often relegated to an afterthought, subject to a heightened risk of environmental degradation and economic volatility related to under-enforced environmental regulations, corporate cost cutting, and volatile energy markets. By highlighting these issues, extractive fictions represent what Joni Adamson has called the literature of environmental justice, or works that redefine environmental issues as social and economic justice issues, and that address these concerns as basic human rights. As such, extractive fictions reinforce central tenets of the environmental justice movement, that there is a correlation between healthy environments and quality of life, that traditional environmental issues such as air and water quality are entangled with social justice issues including poverty, race and gender politics and civil rights, and that ecological crises are often rooted in historically exploitative social systems. Extractive fictions challenge these systems by portraying communities located adjacent to extraction sites as sacrifice zones or geographical regions designated as expendable in the name of the so a so-called greater good, often articulated in terms of economic growth or national security. Expendability is often directly correlated to a community's racial, ethnic, or economic marginality. In the Tainted Desert, Valerie Kuletz coined the phrase geographies of sacrifice to describe the disproportionate effects of Cold War era nuclear testing and hazardous waste disposal in the name of nuclear deterrence and energy development on indigenous communities in the southwestern United States. The concept of sacrifice zones also inspired Joni's theorization of environmental justice literature, particularly in her analyses of the ways in which native writers like Simon Ortiz and Leslie Marmon Silco have responded to the effects of coal and uranium mining in nuclear testing and waste dumping on native communities located in, in landscapes like Black Mesa, the Four Corners region, or the Four Corners region, which the Nixon administration sought to designate a national sacrifice zone in 1972. By approaching energy from this perspective of extraction, I hope to advance existing conversations on the cultural significance of energy and the Anthropocene my term extractive fictions borrows from Amitav Ghosh's notion of petrofiction, a term he famously coined in his 1990 review of Saudi writer Abdul Rahman Munif's City of Salt, Cities of Salt, a novel that fictionalizes the colonization of a Bedouin oasis community by oil, US oil prospectors and the emergence of the modern era petrostate. Ghosh laments what he views as a dearth of literature dedicated to exploring what he calls the oil encounter the collision of Euro-Western geopolitical interests, capitalism, and local communities impacted by extraction. Ghosh's essay has in part inspired the formation of the energy humanities, the sampling of which you'll see here on the screen, an emergent inter interdisciplinary subfield that seeks to delineate, in the words of Imre Seyman and Dominic Boyer, energy's critical role in shaping existing social structures, lived and material infrastructures, and even cultural practices. And I'm gonna be talking a little bit about that in a moment. The field, which has focused much of its critical attention on oil, has engendered a variety of critical perspectives on energy as a cultural artifact best understood by mapping its aesthetic and discursive legacies in literature, art, film, po photography, popular media, and other mediums. Like petrofiction, extractive fictions represent a critical means of delineating energy's embeddedness within the cultural imagination of modernity. However, there's one key difference. Extractive fictions explore energy at the point of extraction, where energy-driven environmental degradation is most acutely felt. Given the inherently transnational character of energy systems, any attempt to narrativize extraction should, I would argue, proceed from what literary critic Stephanie LeMenager has called commodity regionalism, or a regional approach to energy studies that activates vital historical and ecological frames such as we can see and sense them. The presently work exists a substantial body of literary fiction, poetry, film, and visual art that attend to the regional implications of extraction, 
However, here I chose to focus, choose to focus on Appalachia because of its originary status in the U.S. energy economy. The world's very first oil well was drilled in Titusville, Pennsylvania in 1859, and the historical and perhaps unparalleled role extraction has played in regional identity formation. And so this is, uh, I think, a really apt uh, quotation from Jennifer High's recent novel about hydraulic fracturing in western Pennsylvania, Heat and Light. Uh, more than most places, Appalachia is what lies beneath. Um, I think this uh, exemplifies uh, what we'll be talking about in terms of the importance to energy uh, in, in, in Appalachia. So Anne Pancakes, strange as this weather has been, explores the cultural politics and ecological impacts of mountaintop removal mining. I'm gonna be calling this MTR for the rest of the talk uh, as an abbreviation. Um, it takes place in, in West Virginia, Southern West Virginia. Um, drawing on interviews with residents negatively affected by MTR, the novel follows an impoverished family of six uh, living in a landscape one reviewer aptly described as Vesuvian. Pancake's protagonists daily contend with the effects of MTR, including dynamite blasts, the crack building foundations, chemical runoff, and the constant threat of flooding. The novel begins in the wake of the May flood, in which a collapsed impoundment dam sent coal slurry gushing through the community of Yellow Root Hollow, threatening fast food worker Lace, her husband, an out-of-work coal miner named Jimmy, and their four children, Bant, Corey, Dane, and Tommy. The flood drastically alters the physical and psychic topographies of the community, washing away lawns and homes and exacerbating widespread economic anxieties. Much of the novel's plot revolves around tensions between Lace, who becomes involved in anti-MTR activism, and Jimmy, who urges her, her to move the family elsewhere to pursue a livable future. A little background on mountaintop removal mining, or MTR. Um, this practice of removing coal uh, gradually replaced subsurface mining operations after a 1990s amendment to the Clean Air Act, which lowered nationwide emission standards. Um, Southern West Virginia happens to be abundant in what's considered cleaner burning, uh, low sulfur coal, and mountaintop removal mining happens to be the most economically uh, viable way of removing that coal. However, ironically, um, MTR has actually led to uh, what's called, the, what many people refer to as the decapitation of what was once a very lush mountainous region. Um, it involves, the process involves a literal removal of mountaintops to access hard to reach coal seams. Uh, forests are clear cut. Whoops. This is very sensitive. Forests are clear cut. Topsoil is stripped. Underlying earth and rock are blasted intensively to remove what's called overburden, which is then placed into a fill or an area used for waste disposal. Uh, coal seams are then plundered using a drag line, which is a, a, a piece of machinery that is all, often approaches 20 stories in height. Um, impacts include erosion, water contamination, stream sedimentation, alteration of seasonal uh, water cycles, and the threat of mudslides and flash flooding due to the ubiquity of structurally questionable impoundment dams. Um, to give you an idea of what an impoundment dam looks like in the, the vast scale of this operation, this is the Brushy Fork impoundment, impoundment Dam in uh, West Virginia. It's 900 feet tall, which is taller than Hoover Dam. Uh, this one, um, at the time of this photo being taken, uh, held a capacity of 25,000 acre feet of, of, of not just water, but um, debris from mining, chemicals used to treat coal, etc. And this is what it looks like when one of these collapses after, say, uh, a period of particularly strong rains. Um, this is in uh, Tennessee after a coal slurry spill, um, which wiped out a neighborhood near the Tennessee Valley Authority fossil plant. So um, images to keep in mind um, as I continue to talk about Pancake's novel. The ecological effects of MTR, importantly, uh, tend to mirror patterns of economic decline in Appalachia. Uh, because MTR has become increasingly dependent on mechanization and uses only a third of the workers required to extract the same amount of coal from subsurface mines, it has put many local miners out of work. Combined with coal companies' anti-unionization efforts and increased dependence, on out-of-state contract labor, coal mining employment levels have declined in large part due to MTR by more than 50% between 1975 and 2010. 
Other factors, including regulatory pressures and cheaper alternative energy, have contributed to a modest overall industry decline, further rendering coal workers vulnerable. Rich in resources but impoverished, Appalachia arguably, arguably bears a resource curse, a central feature of extractive capitalism in which resource-rich regions of the world are nonetheless plagued by poverty, conflict, and environmental degradation. Uh, the phrase resource curse is often used in relation to uh, economies in Latin America, um, that is, uh, Venezuela would be one, um, that though rich in resources tend to be just plagued by um, economic crises and social crises. Um, a quick note on these, uh, these maps and charts here. On the left-hand side, you're looking at the poverty rate um, in southern West Virginia in relation to the lo uh, location of mountaintop removal mine sites. And there are several similar maps uh, that show not just poverty, but also increased cancer rates, um, exoduses from towns or, or people moving away, um, and other issues, um, life expectancy. And so it, it's really, um, there's a pretty strong correlation between the presence of these, these mines and a decline in quality of life. Uh, and Pancake's novels, uh, dual interest in rendering the visible impacts of MTR on humans and non-humans is apparent in its cover art. Um, so this, this is on the cover of the novel, um, the one edition that's, that's out, um, which bears a photo of Appalachian artist Jeff Chapman Crane's mixed media sculpture, The Agony of Gaia. Um, it's composed of both natural and artificial materials like clay and styrofoam, and it was designed to raise awareness and narrativize the impacts of MTR. The sculpture features the figure of a woman signifying Gaia or the Greek goddess of Earth lying in the fetal position, hands covering her weeping face. Her bare flesh forms the features of a partially stripped mind mountain. Her arms and neck, still covered with trees, give way to a lower body devoid of vegetation, scarred with roads and crawling with drag lines and bulldozers. <clears throat> Engraved at the base of the sculpture is a poem written by Chapman Crane decrying the flesh of fallen trees, the bone gray mounds, of granite stones and the stagnant blood of mud-choked mountain streams. The violence of MTR here is represented as a simultaneous affront to landscapes and human bodies, ecologies, and communities. By framing coal as ecologically and socially harmful and strange, Pancake writes against what Rebecca Scott has called a culture of extraction that has long pervaded the coal fields of Appalachia. In a place where the extractive economy has become synonymous with prosperity and central to regional cultural identity historically, Scott writes, coal can either be told as an exemplar of the American story of progress and technological development or as a story of social injustice and conflict. The former, often used as a symbolic of American exceptionalism, has been a key part of President Trump's economic nationalist rhetoric in which he has promised a so-called end to the war on coal. Waged by, supposedly waged by federal regulatory overreach in poor rural coal communities. Um, yet this deep-seated regional affinity for extraction is complicated by long-standing cultural stereotypes of Appalachia as a region predominantly populated by hillbillies, white trash, and other poor <coughs> whites, an assumption reified and reinforced in the national and, in national and regional cultural representations that reproduce, reproduce tropes of social backwardness and moral abjection. Such misrepresentations have served to stigmatize Appalachians on quasi-racializing terms as deviating from the idealized figure of the productive, patriotic, white American citizen. White in parentheses here. It's implied. Uh, these competing characterizations, Appalachia is either America's heartland or as a cultural backwater, create the conditions of possibility for some of the most dangerous environmental exploitation in the United States. Though Pancake's protagonists hail from a coal family, they are not unabashed coal apologists nor ignorant hillbillies, but simply victims of crippling poverty and environmental degradation associated with MTR. Lace's father, a former coal miner, has recently died of black lung disease, while her husband Jimmy spends his days idly, unable to find work after recovering from a mining injury. Water, in Strange, simultaneously signifies ecological degradation and the erosion of the region's deep-seated identification with coal. 
Polluted streams and ponds are ubiquitous, contributing to the novel's deployment of what Lawrence Buell has termed toxic discourse, a mode of writing pervaded by fear of the poisoned world. The most textured descriptions of toxicity occur in sections of the novel that follow Lace's mechanically inclined son, Corey, for whom exploring nearby streams littered with industrial debris is like walking the aisle of Walmart. By likening a romp in a polluted stream to a gleeful journey through Walmart, Pancake emphasizes a central paradox of extraction culture, Cole's simultaneous fetishization by and exploitation of the working poor. Throughout the novel, Corey and his younger brother Tommy move about this newly discovered playground in search of metal scrap, splashing about in the toxicity of a pig shit colored creek and ponds with water opaque as mustard and colored like the inside of a sick baby's diaper. In a moment of dramatic irony, the region's perceived expendability is affirmed during a little literal scene of sacrifice in which Corey crashes his bicycle into a chemical-laden catchment pond and drowns. Other characters experience this horror through trauma associated with industrial disaster. Avery Taylor repeatedly reflects on his childhood experience as a survivor of the real-life Buffalo Creek flood that took place in Logan County, West Virginia in 1972. The flood was triggered by a collapsed impoundment dam which sent 130 million gallons of coal slurry gushing through Buffalo Creek, devastating 16 coal towns, killing 125 people and displacing more than 4,000. The responsible party, Pittston Mining Company, claimed the flood was caused by unexpectedly heavy rains, but a judge eventually sided with victims in a civil suit, awarding them $13.5 million. Avery's recollections in the novel of Buffalo Creek fixate on water. Washed miles downstream, he recalls taking stock of his surroundings after regaining consciousness on an unfamiliar hillside. The waters have peeled the railroad right off the ground, he thinks. Scattered ties everywhere, then coiled the rails up into lassos. Water did this, he thinks. His mother, Mrs. Taylor, is also preoccupied with water. Her constant reminiscences about Buffalo Creek ending with a refrain that another wall of black water will return on Judgment Day. Her flood-related trauma transverses generations, too, as Lace's emotionally sensitive 12-year-old son, Dane, who cooks and cleans for Mrs. Taylor, begins to feel the weight the water hovering overhead after listening to Mrs. Taylor's sermons warning of impending apocalypse. The novel's Avery sections provide important insight into Pancake's intended historical contextualization of the novel, or of the novel's fictional events. At one point, Avery recalls a time in college when, to cope with the lingering trauma from Buffalo Creek, he exhaustively researches similar mining catastrophes. One of those was the Aberfan Wales disaster of 1968, the only one more deadly than the one he lived through. The events of Aberfan were eerily similar to the Buffalo Creek flood. A spoil tip or a pile of cast off rocks, oil, water, and other byproducts of coal mining collapsed at Merthyr Vale Colliery and roared down a mountainside, flattening part of the small Welsh village of Aberfan in Wales. 144 people died, including 116 children who were in school at the time. Like Buffalo Creek, the responsible party, the National Coal Board, blamed rain, and they got away with it. No one was arrested, fined, or fired, and compensation amounted to 500 pounds per parents of deceased children. Interestingly, counsel for the victims of, Buff of the Buff Buffalo Creek flood later on cited Aberfan in their case and won. On October 28, 1962, approximately one week after the Aberfan incident, Little-known Welsh poet Kyrdric Rees published a short poem, Aberfan, Under the Arc Lights, and The Spectator. In the opening lines, he expresses anxiety towards the return of rain, which prompted the dam's collapse. Ask what was normal in green nature and its pain. Will rain under, uh, undermine our homes and us again? The spirit of Rees's rhetorical plea pervades strange driving the protagonist's increasing alienation from a mountainous landscape in which they long felt a close kinship. As Scott notes, a significant aspect of Appalachian identity arises from a deep sense of indigeneity, or what she describes as, quote, other ways of relating to the land that conflict with the cultural role of extraction. 
Though problematic for obvious reasons, the term indigenous has often been used metonymically to refer to the supposed primitivism of early European settlers in Appalachia who have traditionally lived close to the land through subsistence lifestyles. While this construction simultaneously enacts an erasure of native cultures in the area and further marginalizes rural Appalachian communities, anti-MTR activists often make claims of indigeneity as the environmental ethos driving their yearning for a pre-extraction past. In the novel, Bant and Lace, mother and daughter, identify with, for with the forests and mountains of an idealized Appalachia, where they spend time foraging and fostering a kinship with what they call the deep of here. Lace marvels at how, living in the Appalachian hills, you can grow up shouldered in them, them forever around your ribs, your hips, giving you always, for good or for bad, a sense of being held. After the May flood, however, reverence gives way to anxiety, as they frequently remark about the threat of rain or impending precipitation. When Lace visits friends in a nearby community impacted by MTR, she describes it as a beautiful painting that had been ripped in two by floods, dynamite blasts, and livestock deaths. When Bant discovers a second impoundment dam perched on the edge of the artificially flattened mountaintop above her home, she imagines the next flood. Water, muck and poisons, more trees and trash. Our house would be the first to go. In a momentary bid to numb the pain of loss, she tells herself, I don't care. Here, alienation becomes anguish, as Bant experiences intense feelings of ecological grief an expression that has gained increasing traction in the field of environmental studies to describe the grief it felt in response to experienced or anticipated ecological losses, including the loss of species, ecosystems, and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. Eventually, though, Bant resolves to join her mother, Lace, in the fight against MTR, opening up the possibility of reconnecting with and possibly resurrecting the sacrificed landscape around her. This activist turn punctuates the novel's critique of Appalachian extraction culture. Both Bant and Lace fit the non-traditional profile of anti-MTR protesters as white women, first-time activists from coal families who espouse community values, who have no broad environmentalist agenda beyond remediating local issues, and who have come to these insights through their own life experiences, and are thus first-hand witnesses to the impacts of MTR. While Strange does not explore the complexities of anti-MTR activism in great depth, the novel, in Heather Hauser's words, conceives of activism as a process of making visible, ultimately serving as a documentary and diagnostic purpose in which an acknowledgement of extraction's problematic impacts on humans and non-humans and subverting extraction's centrality to, regional cult to the regional cultural imagination represents an important first step towards the remediation of local environmental injustices underlying modern energy systems. To close, I would like to call attention to the ways in which artists are collaborating with scholars, scientists, architects, and engineers to envision what I call post-extraction futures, where the conditions of possibility for the remediation of environmental and social injustice associated with energy extraction through art the idea of post-extraction futures connects to the existing impetus within the energy humanities to explore the potentialities of energy transitions and post-fossil fuel futures, such as ideas advanced by the University of Alberta's Petrocultures Research Group in their recent collaborative essay collection, After Oil. In that collection, the group emphasizes the critical role of the humanities in envisioning alternative energy futures through literary texts, visual art, performance, and scholarship. While environmental justice literature, such as Pancake's novel, which I just talked about, can accomplish some of this work using language, narration, and scenario imagining, visual, embodied, and community-centered art, I would argue, can be more immediately transformative. As Jennifer Newell, Libby Robin, and Kirsten Weiner write, museums, exhibits, and other forms of public art represent a form of material storytelling with the capacity to reshape and recreate our place in the physical universe. For marginalized communities, writes Giovanna Di Ciro, public art can be socially transformative because it engages in the aesthetic dimensions of the imagination. Those places in the mind that resist colonization are potentially regenerative and can experience freedom. 
Moreover, environmental art can also be physically transformative, offering artists and community members the opportunity to nurture the spirit by transforming one's neighborhood from an industrial sacrifice zone to a place of beauty and vitality. While artists have long responded to environmental change, recent trends during what art historian William Fox has called the third stage of art in the Anthropocene have developed an aesthetics of physical intervention into and remediation of natural systems. Two public art initiatives in Appalachia fit this description by combining memorial, post-extraction aesthetics, and innovative water reclamation technologies to transform extractive sacrifice zones. The AMD and Art Park project in Vintondale, Pennsylvania is one of those. It was conceived as a community-engaged approach to reclaim the abandoned Vinton Colliery site, which has for decades been releasing acid mine drainage, which I'll refer to as AMD, or groundwater tainted with sulfuric acid and iron oxides into nearby watersheds. The park was completed in 2005 under the direction of historian and preservationist T. Allen Comp and involved collaborative efforts by landscape architects, artists, historians, hydrologists, and input from local residents to create a 35-acre walkable park and water treatment system. Water is cleansed using passive water treatment methods. Contaminated creek water is pumped into a limestone pond, which is then which then naturally filters dissolved iron from water and is then discharged downhill into other ponds where it is treated further. So looking here on this map, water is taken here uh, from Blacklet Creek, redirected into this pond, and then the water progressively is cleansed as it moves downhill where it is discharged back into the stream. A thousand trees were strategically planted beside each pond so that in the fall, changing leaves, depending on tree species, would mimic the color of the changing color of the water as it progressively cleansed as it is progressively cleansed as it moves downhill. So right here we have a bunch of trees being planted uh, just right here along each pond. Um, so it kind of looks like this, replete with a wetland section bearing colliery ruins, a trail lined with memorials to Vintondale's coal mining heritage, and a garden. The park is designed to symbolize the success of local residents in healing these waters and this whole site, not only by finishing a job unknowingly abandoned by past generations, but also by developing a new community asset for their families and their families' futures. As the lead designer for AMD and Art Park, Comp has emphasized the importance of an approach to reclamation that considers the complex cultural and historical forces shaping a region alongside environmental issues at hand. AMD is more than just a water problem, he says. It is deeply emblematic of the economic and environmental abandonment throughout Appalachian coal country. While scientific approaches to reclamation can be materially effective, Comp argues, approaching degraded environments as cultural artifacts enables a more community-based approach to reclamation. The siting of AMD art and Art Park reflects these ambitions. Vintondale has long been defined by coal, both in its heyday as a coal town controlled by Vinton Coal Company and its decline after the last mine closed in 1950, sparking an exodus and plunging the town into decades of slow economic decline. By acknowledging local history and working with the community to remediate its worst effects, the project became an opportunity for civic healing that mobilizes citizens to prioritize healthy environments and communities over economic development. So here's just a, a quick picture of some of the memorial work here at the park. Um, of note here on the bottom is the entrance to the coal mine, which is closed by a marble mural depicting some of the coal miners uh, that, that once worked in this mine. Um, there's also a baseball diamond, um, as you can see up in the left-hand corner, and then a, uh, a uh, tile map here, um, which is lined by historic photos such as that one up in the top right-hand corner. Artist activist John Sabra and environmental engineer Guy Riefler, this is, this is John Sabra, um, both professors at Ohio University have taken a similarly innovative approach to confront the legacies of Appalachia's extractive economy. Riefler, who researches industrial pollution, developed a way 
to filter iron oxides from AMD, converting it into usable pigments and returning clean water into stream beds. While refining the process, he began collaborating with Sabra, who has long used natural materials in his own artwork and specializes in pigments. Sabra began to refine and incorporate Riefler's pigments into his paintings, resulting in collections like Chroma, which has been featured in galleries across the United States and garnered substantial media coverage as what is being referred to as toxic art. In his artist statement, Sabra explains that the goal of his work is to understand the underground excoriations that are coal mines and the ways in which they affect human and non-human relations. So I'm gonna play you a very brief uh, video clip here just to show you how this process work, works because it's fascinating. And then I will close. Just about a minute or so. This is acid mine drainage, pollution from coal mining. It is a worldwide problem and kills aquatic life in nearly 1,300 miles of streams in Ohio alone. But with your help, we can clean up this toxic sludge by turning this pollution into non-toxic pigments and paints. Here's how we do it. Water leaches out of coal mines and at first it is clear, but it actually contains high levels of sulfuric acid and heavy metals such as iron. We neutralize the acidity by adding a base, which causes the dissolved iron to begin to crystallize, turning dark green. Then we add oxygen, and the crystals become iron oxide, turning orange. Over time, the iron crystals settle to the bottom, separating clear, clean water on top, which can be returned to the stream as it is now safe for aquatic life. The separated, non-toxic iron oxide can be set out to dry. And once dry, we can grind this 90% pure iron oxide into a powdered pigment. Our pigment from acid drainage can be used just like any other pigment to make many kinds of paints. And if we heat this pigment to 1000 degrees Fahrenheit, it becomes this deep red. And this beautiful violet is the result of heating to 2000 degrees Fahrenheit. This color is so interesting that Gamblin Artist Colors is making a limited edition of it as an oil paint and we want to share it with you. This paint can be used just like any other oil paint, mixed with thickening mediums for impasto work. Okay, so that's sort of a sample of what uh, John Sabra is doing. Let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint here. Now, recently, okay, what's going on? So that video was from John Sabra's recent, I'm gonna have to come over here and do it manually, um, his recent Kickstarter campaign, which just ended last week, um, in which he and his, his friend Guy Riefler teamed up with a hydrologist to, to design and build a pilot treatment processing and processing facility in Corning, Ohio. Um, and in doing so, they hope to prove the scalability of the process and through commercial partnerships, actually sell the paint that they're generating through acid mine drainage and reinvest the proceeds into uh, stream reclamation. Um, they, they met their goal of $30,000. I think they raised something like $33,000. Um, and this here is a result of some of the art that's being created uh, using this paint. John Sabra actually uh, painted this one. Um, it's part of his Chroma collection, which has been featured in galleries all over the United States. Um, now, I recently spoke with uh, John Sabra on the phone. I actually had an interview with him a couple weeks ago, and he insisted um, that the wall was the, um, the wall around the, uh, the, the treatment plant was the crux of the project from a community engagement perspective, which I, I think is really interesting. Um, now, he, he says the team has worked with the community on a one-on-one -on -one basis because it, initially there was some skepticism as to what these folks were doing on their local creek. Um, but he found that by doing so, people became more open uh, to allowing this, this plant to be built and this wall to be built around it, um, mainly because they talked to the community about how they were going to um, bring the creek back to the way it was before it was polluted when uh, a lot of the local residents used to fish or swim in it and it was a sort of central part of the community. Um, so in working in conjunction with his students, um, Sabra hopes to design a wall that he says will educate and celebrate the town. Um, and while the wall will definitely it'll tell the story about how pollution got there, it'll have the scientific process. Um, 
and make a case for the necessity of the plant, it will also celebrate the history of Corning, which is also, like Bentondale, a thriving coal town until the mid-1950s uh, when the mines began to close down nearby. Uh, and, and what Sabra told me towards the end of our conversation really struck me. He says he hopes to connect the town's past to a more livable and prosperous future. And he said he hopes to emphasize that the wall around it, which will be historicizing coal in the region, isn't viewed as a tombstone for their town, but rather as something that they might look forward to. Um, so here's a, a brief, or a little bit of an overview. It's still in its very early stages of some proposed uh, wall design concepts. It's not a huge plant, um, but this, these are some of the ideas. And he's actually just working with his uh, undergraduate and graduate students. Uh, this one on the right here was designed by his graduate students and submitted about a week ago to him. And so he's, he's sort of crowdsourcing uh, crowdsourcing online um, ideas for this project and taking a sort of very democratic approach to it. So um, if extraction has historically entailed the sacrifice of communities and ecologies, then AMD and Art Park and John Sabra's Toxic Art Initiative uh, advance restorative visions to the future. Each acknowledges a pollutive industrial past, but literally through water reclamation propels communities into an alternative post-extraction future. As such, they can be viewed as ecological counter monuments in the spirit of memory studies scholar James E. Young's characterization of Holocaust m monuments in Germany or memorials in Germany as brazen, painfully self-conscious memorial spaces conceived to challenge the premises of their very being. Unlike traditional monuments, which are built to withstand the physical ravages of time, in homage to some perpetual truth, Young writes, the counter monument celebrates its own physical impermanence, the, con the contingency of all meaning and memory. As ecological counter monuments, AMD and Art Park and John Sabra's Toxic Art Initiative memorialize extraction in Appalachia, as not as emblematic of some bygone era of progress, even in a region economically decimated by its decline, but rather as an impermanent, replaceable practice, the pollutive effects of which are extracted, if you will, from landscapes poisoned by energy development. Each, by functioning as a balm for the scars of extraction, offers hope and a roadmap for a more equitable energy future beyond cultures of extraction. <laughs>